Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today for another installment of our research webinar series hosted by our team here at the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute, or MVLRI. The goal of MVLRI is to expand Michigan's capacity to support new learning models, engage in active research to inform new policies in online and blended learning, and strengthen the state's infrastructures for sharing best practices. MVLRI is a division of MVU, or the Michigan Virtual University, a nonprofit organization whose mission is advancing K-12 education through digital learning, research, innovation, policy, and partnerships. MVU is also the parent company of Michigan Virtual School, a supplemental state-sponsored virtual school, Michigan LearnPort, an online professional development portal for K-12 educators and personnel, and MyBlend, a blended learning initiative providing K-12 schools with resources, products, and services to personalize learning options for their students and improve student achievement. Before we begin today, just a quick disclaimer. This webinar will be recorded and shared publicly. Consequently, anything shared during this webinar, including chat comments, could be shared publicly. This webinar may represent a presenter's or an attendee's personal views, opinions, conclusions, and other information which do not necessarily reflect those of MVU and or the Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and are not given nor endorsed by MVU slash MVLRI unless otherwise specified. Presenting with us today, we have our own Rebecca Stimson, who is our senior writer. Rebecca joined MVLRI in 2012. She has English education credentials and a BA in Urban Development-Urban Education from Michigan State University. In addition, she earned an MA in Educational Policy Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She taught personalized developmental reading and writing at Lansing Community College for six years and has over 25 years of experience writing and editing for a variety of audiences. We also have with us Dr. Jared Borup, who is an assistant professor in the Division of Learning Technologies at George Mason University. Dr. Borup earned his PhD in Instructional Psychology and Technology from Brigham Young University in 2013. Previous to earning his PhD, Jared taught history at a junior high school for six years. He has taught online and blended courses since 2008. In his current position, he is working to build the integration of online learning in schools' master's and certificate program, which began its first cohort in fall 2014. He recently served as a fellow for George Mason's Office of Distance Education and led an initiative that prepared faculty for the challenges of online instruction. His current research interests include developing online learning communities and identifying support systems that adolescent learners require to be successful in online environments. With that, I will hand it over to our presenters. I guess that's me. Okay. Uh, I assume everyone can hear me okay. Um, so today we're going to talk about Michigan Mentor Models, uh, which is a great uh, title, I think. And, uh, over the past year, I've had a, a wonderful opportunity to work as a fellow um, with MVLRI um, and really work with, with a, an excellent team to try to explore um, mentoring and, and some support structures for them. And we've given previous uh, presentations or webinars on, on, our, our, on our work. Um, what we're going to present today will really focus on some of the models that uh, Rebecca has, has found um, as she's gone through and, and interviewed some of the mentors and some of those profiles. And, and what I'll do is I'll try to set that up um, by talking a little bit about mentors and, and the importance of mentors. So I'll, I'll talk about the larger research in that area. So, so when we talk about uh, mentors, there's different words that are used, a facilitator, a coach. Sometimes it's called a learning coach or a success coach or a coordinator. Um, sometimes they are, uh, can, can be a parent if the student is studying at home or um, a lot of times they're provided by the school um, at the brick and mortar school so that students can work with them face to face. So, so that's what we're really focusing on in this. So in the chat window, I'd just like you to answer uh, this question. So what are the factors, or maybe the factor, in your opinion, the top factor, um, that most impacts student retention? Okay, so we got the teacher. Good. Caring. Excellent.
Yeah, so Randy, engagement is, is a big thing um, and something that, that's used quite a bit. Uh, there's behavioral engagement and cognitive engagement and affective engagement. So again, we got caring and then also relationship with educators that Catherine put down. Michelle, that's really interesting. So feeling of importance, but but so self-importance, but also that the course is important. I, I would I would add on to that as well. So so Justin also has a connection and relationships. Oh, so previous experience. What what Catherine mentioned that that's important, right? Um, and we'll talk about that in, as well. So uh, Randy also brought up kind of uh, a sense of control or, or locus of control um, over their own learning, and, and that is critical. And, and there is a recent study uh, that we'll actually highlight in here that focuses on locus of control as well. So um, while I was preparing this presentation, I saw a, a study that just came out. This was done in higher ed. So we have to um, remember that, that it doesn't apply 100% to, to K-12 because the population is different. But they found three things. Uh, the, the top one was student self-discipline. So this is really student abilities. Uh, I think we can expand that to uh, motivation, self-motivation or self-regulation, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the other one is the quality of instructor-student interactions, and I think we can also build on that for relationships or caring and things like that that, that you mentioned um, in the chat window. Um, but remember, this was higher ed, so I think we could expand the, the quality of instructor-student interactions and relationships to also include parental um, engagement or mentors that we'll be talking about today. And then the, the last one was institutional support to students. And so that's one thing that we'll really focus on in this presentation too. So when I read through this study, it really matched up with, with what we're talking about. So, and Johnson um, viewed two aspects of teaching, and, and this is regardless of context, if it's face-to-face -face or online. There's the academic side, and then there's the human side. And so we'll talk about what is the academic side and what is the human side. So the human side, uh, Graham in the handbook of blended learning basically said that learners are drawn to online learning because of the flexibility. Uh, but once they get there, they also don't want to sacrifice the social interaction and the human touch that they've grown accustomed to in the face-to-face -face classroom. So online teachers can really develop that um, interaction, but it's also somewhat limited because they're at a distance. So th there are some challenges to providing that to all students. Because in, in an online environment, interactions are very planned um, and deliberate a lot of times. They, they don't necessarily diverge off topic very easily. Um, and in contrast, in a face-to-face -face environment, our interactions tend to be more spontaneous and informal um, and can create uh, a sense of rapport or trust uh, that takes more time to develop in an online environment. Not, it's not to say that it can't be done. It obviously can be done. In some cases, it can actually be stronger um, in an online environment than a face-to-face -face environment, but it does take more time. Also, having a physical presence uh, allows you to more easily motivate students. Uh, again, you can do this on, uh, online, but your set of incentives that you can use is, is somewhat limited compared to an online or compared to a face to face or brick and mortar, mortar environment. So at the academic side, this was the article about uh, locus of control. Um, great article that just came out uh, by Susan Lowe's. Um, the very first sentence was actually this in the article and I just wanted to put an exclamation point at the end of it. That uh, we're, we're really coming to understand that when students take an online course, they're really kind of taking a course and a half. They're taking the course to learn the content, but also there's kind of a half a course on how to learn online uh, because they're not experiencing that. Uh, and so when Catherine mentioned in the chat window that previous experience is important, that's why, because um, if you've already taken some courses and you don't have to take that course and a half or that um, half a course again. So, so that's important to remember. Also, younger students tend to have low self-regulation skills, and so we've mentioned before that the top finding that they found in, in the first study that we talked about was 
the ability to self-regulate. Well, younger students don't necessarily have that ability. And online, you can really get a great sense for what students are doing online with the analytics and the LMS that you're using. And in some ways, it's easier to tell what your students are doing online uh, than it is in a face-to-face -face course. However, when students go offline, it's really hard to know what they're doing. Um, and so, so this can be a challenge for online teachers to help students self-regulate. The other thing I wanted to highlight here um, is that there is a connection between the academic and the human. Although Johnson said that there's the academic side and the human side of, of teaching, clearly they're connected. And uh, Garrison, <coughs> excuse me, Garrison in his Community of Inquiry Framework in 2000 really highlighted that. And since that time, over the past 15 years, lots of research has gone into um, identifying this relationship, and clearly there, there is one. So um, if you want to improve your academic uh, outcomes, you also have to focus on the human side of, of teaching. So what are the support systems? Remember that first study said the number three thing was a support system. So support systems that, that can help students with the human and the academic side of learning. So this is a supplemental model, this, this graphic. So when, when students take most of their courses in a brick and mortar school and then maybe one online course or two online courses, uh, and, and if you're a teacher over that course, this is, this is kind of what, you look, what you're looking at. So the middle figure here, let me get the pointer. The middle fi uh, figure here is the, is the teacher. And he's got students in school A, school B, school C, school D, um, which can be challenging uh, to, to manage all of, all of your students. Um, but not only that, all these students have parents and guardians as well that, that, that need to be keep informed and uh, know what's going on. So for a teacher, although you can develop very close relationships online, it, it can be difficult to, to provide that human side of, of learning to all of, all of your students. Um, and also work with uh, parents and coordinate with them. So one support system that's becoming more common is the mentor model that we'll be talking about today. So one way to support teachers is to provide a on-site mentor or facilitator at each of the, of the schools. Um, and they, they work with, with students face-to-face. -face. They're typically not the content expert. Uh, but, but they do need to know how to motivate students. Uh, they do need to know how to learn online so they can help students with that academic side as well. Um, but this is a very powerful uh, support system uh, that, that we've kind of explored um, at MBLRI. So, so why mentors? Uh, so some research that's been coming out, there hasn't been a lot of research, but the emerging research has really found that the mentor is critical. So in this study, they, to quote them, they said that facilitators uh, that are directly working with students day by day, and I think that's important regularly, are key to the success of the program. And because of uh, the reason why is that students' ability to handle distance education is really due to their motivation and self-direction and ability to take responsibility. So mentors can directly impact that. Uh, in, in another article, this was uh, about 14 years ago, but again, it's very applicable to today. Uh, and to quote them, they said that it's to have a, a mentor is is crucial to the degree in which students maintain engagement in activities. So um, someone mentioned in the chat window earlier that engagement. Randy mentioned engagement um, was a critical component, and mentors can really facilitate that engagement. So what do mentors do? Um, HARMS is really the, and, and, and this team was really the first to outline a framework for what mentors do. Remember, they're not the content expert, they're not the teacher, but they can provide some really critical auxiliary support to students. So the first one that they highlighted was that they need to understand students on a very personal level. Um, and, and act as a mentor or friend. Uh, the second one is aiding students in the development of study, organization, and self-regulation skills. So really, this, this goes on with 
um, knowing how to learn online. And to build off of that, encouraging communication. A lot of students don't know how to communicate with an adult online. They, they might communicate with friends or text friends or things like that, but actually writing an email to a teacher or, or calling up a teacher, that's very foreign to them, and, and they really need help to do that. And also, uh, Mentors can act as a communication link between students, parents, and the online teacher. So it's really important. Uh, mentoring student, or monitoring uh, student grades and overall course progress. So they really need to get in there and look for early warning signs when students aren't engaged in, in the learning process or are getting behind. Um, and also counseling students on course enrollment. So, so it might not be the right time for students to take an online course, or it might not be the right course for them to take. And so mentors can really um, prevent problems from occurring uh, by counseling with students before they even enroll in an online course. So people also ask, um, how, much, how much do mentors need to be engaged? Well, that's a very complex question, and, and the answer is also complex. But, but I think that there is kind of an uh, inverse correlation here of mentors need to, need to engage in students' ability. So I try to highlight that in this uh, graphic. So if it's, if it's uh, full color, that means that it's full engagement or full ability over here. And then if it fades to white, that means uh, no engagement um, or no ability over here. So basically, if, if students have very low engagement, or, or sorry, if, if students have low ability to engage, then obviously the mentor needs to be more fully engaged. Um, but as students progress in their ability, mentors can take a step back. But it, so in a lot of programs, if students have proven that they're, they're doing well in a course, then they're provided more autonomy on when and where they work. So um, th thanks for sharing that, Randy, about uh, the, the COI model and, and providing that link. I, I think that's a great framework to understand uh, support systems as well, and that human and um, the, the connection between the human and the academic. So the, the, the other thing that, that's important to remember is that mentors really require professional development to know when and how they should be engaged. Because this is a complex uh, task that we're asking them to do. So the, the impact of professional development, there has been some research that has shown that, that it's very important and it can make a difference. So Florida Virtual Schools, they found that mentors who receive professional development, uh, their students um, achieved at a higher level than, than those uh, students who had mentors that didn't receive professional development. There hasn't been very much research on what types of professional development work, um, but there was a group that, that found that scenario-based professional development was really important. Um, and what they did was they provided them scenarios and then um, had a facilitated discussion around that uh, with an expert so that they could respond to how they might act in a similar situation. And our work at MVLRI, we've uh, created a, a, a mentor orientation model that, that is also scenario-based at the end. There are um, video vignettes of, of, or sorry, there are scenarios, and then there's videos of actual mentors responding to those scenarios so that uh, if you're new, new to the, being a mentor, you can kind of uh, see how experts or those that are experienced are doing it. And I just love this quote uh, that, and Justin, thanks for sharing that, um, that facilitators are made, not born. And the problem is a lot of um, administrators just assume that they can do it. Uh, and I think that this is a great quote from, a, from an online teacher that, that was asked, what advice would you give to facilitators? And this online teacher said, facilitators, and I put in administrators, because I think that's really important. So facilitators and administrators need to understand that this is an actual job, not a duty period. Uh, they need to take, take it seriously. You can't teach a face-to-face -face class and facilitate an online course at the same time. And often, mentors are just tapped on the shoulder and said, OK, you're going to be the mentor for these students. Um, and then they're never given 
the professional development. And even if you're a classroom teacher, so I was a classroom teacher for six years. Um, if someone asked me to be a mentor to online students, I don't know how how well I would have done, right? Because I I, I wouldn't have known what it took to to, to learn online. Um, and so, even if you're an experienced face-to-face -face teacher, you still need to uh, receive some professional development on on what it means to be a mentor to online learners. Um, and and th in this graphic, we can really see that that mentors are, are crucial. Um, oftentimes, they're working with uh, students in several courses, so they're working with several teachers, online teachers, and, and students and parents as well. So this really is a, con a critical component when we're talking about uh, support systems for students to be successful. So with that, I'll, I'll turn the time over uh, to Rebecca. Thanks, Jared. Uh, how's the volume? I'm not shouting, am I? I'm not seeing any response, so I guess it's okay. A little low. All right, I'll turn this up a little bit. Thanks, Joe. Is that better? Okay, I'll turn it up a little bit more. Um, and All right, uh, thank you, Jared. Um, as as uh, now that Jared has described some of the research about the effect mentors can have on the success of online learners, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've learned about some mentoring programs uh, in Michigan. This list uh, on the slide came from Julie Howe, who's the online learning coordinator at Three Rivers here in Michigan. She and her team of full-time mentors, by the way, will be conducting a webinar on May 4th, so stay tuned for that. Um, you can see how these charges coincide or compare with the slide that Jared shared about the benefits of, of mentors and reinforce the, the points that he made about the human academic uh, connection in his discussion. And also, you know, when you think about the fact that the individual has to cover um, and, and work at all these levels, why it's so important that mentors actually be full-time uh, employees and not have other responsibilities uh, like teaching or being an assistant principal or being a counselor, which is one of the things that we found in some of the um, interviews I did. So the mentor case studies um, came about because we recognize the influence that mentors have on students and how they contribute to student success. And we wanted to describe the range of approaches to mentoring in Michigan and to share what successful mentors are doing by taking a case study approach. I began by asking MVU customer service and salespeople who they knew who would be, they thought would be willing to talk to me and uh, spend some time uh, talking about what they do and who they knew to be doing a successful job of mentoring students. So I ended up interviewing 14 mentors at 10 schools and uh, under un uncovered these various structures that will be further revealed in the profiles. So here's a little chart of the Michigan Mentor Program demographics from those 10 schools. And you can see they range from the um, rural to the urban. And uh, I've included the number of students uh, enrolled in the school in the 2013 school year and the number of mentors interviewed, the gender of the mentors, the years that they had been mentoring, and the average number of students that were being mentored. And again, this is 2013-14 uh, data, so things have changed a little bit um, in some of those places. But uh, the numbers basically remain pretty close to the same. So the um, interview protocol was um, over the phone. I asked 20 questions, a little, a few over 20 questions to get at the, the who, what, uh, how and when, and uh, you'll see how those questions led to the profile framework in a couple of slides here. The interviews had a purpose beyond providing the profiles of the programs. In addition to developing the case studies, we were updating a guide for mentors that had been written by an MVS mentor several years ago. So we ended up with um, mentor fundamentals a guide for mentoring online learners, which is 
fortified with content from the interviews. In fact, it is, I like to say, rich with the wisdom of those doing the job. It is largely content provided to me by the mentors in the context of these interviews. The same is true of the Mentoring Basics module that Jared referred to earlier, that Jared created um, and with a lot of support from Justin uh, in terms of putting it into Articulate. Uh, so the mentors can also become oriented um, to the job and um, while we know that most mentors have not had any specific training, we thought that this would provide them with a jumping off point and um, we, as Jared mentioned, engaged some mentors in that process. Again, that was Julie Howe and her folks from Three Rivers. More about this at the end. We have a list of resources at the end. Um, yes, Jared, it was a very much a group project and the group got larger and it was it's quite exciting. I, I hope that we will be getting more feedback from folks as, as people start to use it. So the next slides, oh, and, and then of course there are the profiles, lest we forget the profiles. So these next slides, um, can show what the content of the profiles will be and uh, the basic questions around which the profiles are organized. So you'll see, you know, it's sort of the basics again, the who, what, where, when, how. Um, in terms of the who is the mentor facilitator, it includes things like what their background and experience are and what the mentor is expected to do and other support relationships uh, that the mentor has at the school or online. Um, and then in terms of the foundational elements, that is largely about the context or history of online learning in the school and how the mentor course facilitator fits in and what the vision may be. Of course, the responses from people are vary quite a bit, so you'll see once, once the um, profiles are published, which we hope to be in the next couple of weeks, uh, they, you'll see the, the way people interpret what foundational elements are, for example, and um, what the, the role of the mentor actually may be. Uh, and continuing in terms of the content is um, wh when students have access to the mentor and how they actually fulfill their responsibilities. One of the things I'm most excited about is um, the best practice components. You will see in the Mentor Fundamentals, there's a quote from every one of the mentors that I interviewed about a best practice that they use, but there's so much more that came through in the interview, so there'll be an entire section devoted to best practices, and um, they're also included in each interview where uh, our profile are the challenges and rewards that people face. So uh, I kind of skip, skipped ahead here. In addition to the program profiles, as I say, you'll see that collection of best practices, but you're also going to see a summary of the program uh, commonalities and, and where they diverge. And then another thing that I'm really excited about is uh, advice. That was one of the questions that I, or uh, actually four questions that I asked was about advice that mentors have for administrators, parents, students, and teachers. Uh, and um, those will be largely direct quotes from mentors in once the publication is uh, ready. So what you, what you will also see is um, a lot of, again, direct quotes from mentors about how they define student success and what they uh, think is the profile of a good mentor. And these, obviously, these, um, the text here is, is direct quotes from people. And um, of course, one of my favorites is, I love this job. I always have your back. I am always here. This points to that uh, component that Jared touched on as well, the importance of the relationship and um, the student understanding that they're not alone. And this is a point that came up uh, from a number of mentors that students just need to know that they're not, they're not alone, that there's somebody else there uh, to support them. So uh, one of the things that we found in terms of the commonalities that is that most mentors hold other positions. Uh, they And they ranged from the full-time teacher to the um, assistant principal. That's not on the list here because it only happened in one of the interviews that I, that I did, but I, we know that there are many administrators who hold um, the mentor role as well. Um, and as Jared mentioned, most people are kind of tapped on the shoulder to be the the mentor. It's just added to their responsibilities. Uh, but then there are those who have been um, 
moved into the role away from another role in, in institutions where it's recognized that, that the mentor uh, has enough responsibility that they can take on the role full time. Most of the people who are uh, mentors have had some kind of history with the school, either as a parent, uh, some of them are alumni of the institution, uh, some of them have been substitute teachers, and again, some have held other positions um, in the school uh, and, and have been um, moved into the mentor role. We do have some um, media center, for, I've met some media center directors who are also mentors. One of the things that Jared and I talked about was sharing um, how uh, the logistics vary for people. And you'll see, um, again, there are more people who have dedicated space in this pool of 14 than don't, but there are those who, who also allow students to um, do their online work in the location that they're comfortable in, after the, typically after they reach a 76% achievement and success and uh, completion rate. But obviously everyone is scheduled, uh, all the schools schedule an online course as they would an in-school class, but not everyone has dedicated space. So in school A and B, they have scheduled class time, but the, the mentors actually meet with students in a different place. Um, one, a couple of them have dedicated labs or class, and then um, a couple have uh, the students meet in the library or media center. One of the schools, uh, the time with the mentor is just um, on an as-needed basis, and they go and do their work wherever they are comfortable working. And then uh, in School D, that is um, a mentor situation where the mentor is a full-time teacher. So he meets with students before and after school and tracks them down at lunch, and the students are expected to be in the library working. So this is one of the, um, again, uh, at Jared's suggestion, showing you kind of the extremes of um, what uh, I saw between a particular suburban school and a mid-sized town. And again, once the profiles are, are published, you'll you know, be able to see all the details. But um, these are programs that are at the opposite end of the continuum. Uh, the suburban school, the full-time counselor is the mentor and has the responsibility of 300 students at the school as a counselor. And those are any students that take an online course within that 300, she is the mentor of record for those students. Um, they do have a scheduled class time, but they check in in the guidance counseling office and then they go where they choose to study. And the students are expected to initiate um, any uh, support that they need from the counselor. Her uh, stand is that the focus is on student responsibility, and she said that that has led to some confusion on the part of teachers who expect her to intervene, and it really is they place the onus on the student. And the student is, is prepared for that when they do um, their orientation, if you will, when the student first comes to them and, and expresses an interest in, in learning online. They're given um, a contract that they discuss and sign that explains that the, teach, that the student will not be in a classroom and all the instruction will take place online and that the student has a high degree of uh, responsibility for that. And then on the other hand, in a mid-sized town, we have a, a program that has multiple full-time mentors who have, again, the students have scheduled class time, and those students are ass assigned to a particular mentor and a particular lab. The mentors interact with each other a lot, and they also interact with the other tiers of support at the school but the students have a mentor that they develop a relationship with and um, the support in that situation is initiated by the mentor and uh, or the student. They have daily interaction. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, sharing support, but at least they greet the students every day and they circulate among the students and you know are present for the student to uh, get get whatever they might need. And they, they also check in regularly. They have weekly check-ins. And again, in the suburban school, it's, it's a, an as-needed uh, check-in. So the 
uh, premise of the mentoring program in the mid-sized town is that they, they focus on uh, personalized learning experience and an effective uh, learning experience for the student. So the next few slides are quotes from the interviews, uh, but probably represent comments many mentors would make. For this particular mentor, his challenges, he, he also is a full-time teacher, but he is released for, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, three hours a day, and each hour he has to change classrooms, which is really a function of um, classroom space. And again, I, I'm guessing this is probably true at a lot of schools, where space is just at a premium. But um, uh, he, otherwise, he is uh, devoted to the online students when they are scheduled, so he's in a classroom with just online students, three hours a day. And then this, again, is another classic. Uh, time management concerns are almost always the very first thing that someone, uh, that a mentor and teachers mention about the challenge for online learners. So uh, this um, uh, person actually uh, singles out the request for hard deadlines, again, something that often is brought up by teach by mentors. Um, that's kind of a problem given that the mantra of online learning is any time, any pace. And so uh, it works kind of in conflict with what um, many teachers and mentors feel is actually good for students, and that is to have better boundaries, better deadlines. Um, but he also touches here on motivating students who aren't doing well and the fact that when you're not the teacher, you don't have authority over the course and assignments, so sometimes you're limited in, in what you can do. Uh, Jared talked a little bit about the challenge of, uh, or the, the, the fact that motivating students is sometimes easier when you ha are in f uh, physical proximity to them because there are um, various ways that you can, various strategies that you can use that are easier to um, put into place if you're in the same space with them and not uh, online. So as for the uh, rewards, now again, um, a common theme, people are really happy about being able to provide an opportunity for students who otherwise would not have access to particular content or particular courses. Many of the schools uh, are just too small to offer um, AP options to students who want to excel and also um, special courses, sign language was mentioned by one of the mentors, there's a, a student who has um, uh, members of the family are deaf and without online learning the student would not have learned ASL, so it's an opportunity to meet needs that students have that, that otherwise just couldn't be met in the brick and mortar school in their community. And then this is another one that um, we hear often anecdotally and, and also have heard from teachers, and that is that kids who, who struggle in a face-to-face -face environment, uh, who experience bullying or have confidence issues, may be considered marginal, as this uh, individual said, can get into a course and be anonymous and really excel. Um, he also went on to say that you mix students together who wouldn't other, otherwise be in the same course or mingle with each other and uh, they get to see uh, how others can, can, can succeed and, and grow from experiences that they wouldn't, wouldn't ordinarily have had. So now to the resources. These, um, uh, these are the uh, valuable, really valuable mentor resources that have been developed. Uh, this, uh, the mentor fundamentals and mentoring basics directly related to the interviews that were conducted and, and full of content from those uh, mentors that were interviewed. But all of these um, resources are valuable regardless of the provider. We made a special effort to provide information that was generalizable, that was generic. And um, in fact, for those of you who are not local, uh, we can brand Mentor Fundamentals and the Parent Guide to Online Learning for your school or district or program. 
Uh, again, Mentoring Basics, the online mentoring uh, training module, includes the um, clips of the real mentors talking about what they do and how they address challenging common issues. Um, and as Jared said, it, it touches on that scenario element that he mentioned earlier. The last unit, I, I believe it's five units long, and the last unit is all scenarios of what would you do, uh, posing what would you do questions. and um, giving the mentor who's going through the module the opportunity to type in a response and then view a video clip of an experienced mentor talking about how they address the issue. So not only is this uh, um, a resource that can be used by an individual, but it can also be used with a group of mentors in a personal learning community um, to generate discussion. It, the, um, the Mentoring Basics and also um, OLAP, that last uh, resource there, which somehow I failed to add the link. Maybe Justin can, can add that in the uh, chat box. Um, can be used in pieces or in their totality. They are in a t articulate and you can get in and out of them um, easily. The, the, um, our, our new um, Mentors Matter folks who are going to speak next are working on a more robust uh, um, rubric that will actually place students into OLAD in the sections where they show that they are challenged or need more uh, suggestion, uh, more um, experience. And I want to say this, this uh, again addresses one of the points that Jared made about helping students learn about how to learn online. It's a very good uh, example of what online learning is like because it's in uh, a program that is used in uh, uh, courses that um, are, are taught online and it has the same kind of components that students need to learn to be able to manipulate and give students practice. Uh, so um, we're very excited about that. That is uh, out and available and um, the mentoring basics I want to say is also in its beta phase right now. I think Justin made that comment when he um, posted the link for mentoring basics. So we're looking for feedback. We're always looking for feedback um, and we're always um, interested in improving and making things uh, meet the needs of the uh, folks out in the field. In fact, all of these resources were created as a response to requests from the field and are part of the Institute's legislative charge. The 21F toolkit resources is really specific to the legislation that um, gave uh, public school students the option of taking online courses and uh, yet many of the resources in that toolkit, again, are generic and uh, used to folks regardless of where they live or what, what kind of um, courses they're taking online. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Ken Durkin to talk about Mentors Matter. Thank you, Becky. Hopefully uh, everyone can hear me. Um, I just want to very quickly talk about the new initiative that MVU has put into place. Um, we are planning on building and uh, focusing our efforts around uh, fostering an organic community of practice for mentors. This is why we've called it Mentors Matter. Um, the great research and work that MDLRI has done and the tools that they've created, we're hoping to provide that as a uh, Mentors Matter as a clearinghouse and the website's available at mentorsmatter.org. Um, we'll put a lot of those resources linked there, um, links to MVLRI's research, the work that Jared's done that's been great, and, and that Becky and Justin and, and everybody at MVLRI has done. Um, we're breaking this up into different sections. We think it's very important to look at kind of a holistic view of, of a mentor's role in a school. Um, and this is why we have, we're going to have sections and have sections currently for mentors as well as school leaders and administrators and students. Uh, and if I advance to the next slide, the sections that we will have will have a, a comprehensive set of what we call map tools, which are mentor action planning tools. Um, the first one that Becky mentioned was the student readiness rubric. This is taking the rubric that's in the mentoring uh, online students fundamental guide uh, and breaking it down into a more student-centered version where the one that's in the guide is for mentors to help look at students and, and assess whether they're not, well, 
check whether they're not they're prepared and have the uh, resources they need to be successful in an online course. We're going to make this uh, a version which students can take uh, and, and then get a score themselves uh, and check against like what areas they seem to be lacking in. Uh, and then, as Becky mentioned, point them to other resources that are already available and other resources that we plan on uh, uh, providing to them to help build those skill sets that they may, uh, may need. We are also um, doing map tools for school leaders in terms of the uh, program planning for online around mentors, um, types of uh, facilities and resources they may need. You know, the research shows that having uh, a dedicated space for online learners uh, can improve their outcomes. So uh, those types of things, the helping administrators think through that, and, and that's work that's also done in the online and blended learning uh, guide that, that MBU created in 2012. So we're using that to, to help bolster those decision-making points. And then uh, there will be several other things that we're doing. But the, the key part that I want to mention again is that we're trying to build a network. So if you look at uh, the mentor profiles when they come out, the work that Becky has done on them and, and talking to people, we found that there was a need to connect mentors to other mentors. Um, everybody has such a diverse uh, a set of resources at their disposal, diverse jobs and roles that they play in the school, um, and it's it's best to get them connected together so that they can share best practices and stories, uh, as well as uh, how they deploy their resources and how they think about their online programs uh, and, and make that successful st for students. So that's a huge component of what we're doing and, and planning to lay out. Now the site's really new. This is an a initiative that MVU has uh, put into place only since January. And so the site is the first step, just having kind of a launch pad for that. You can actually subscribe for more updates about things that are put on the site and resources that are made available at the site, which is mentorsmatter.org. And, and then we'll be able to take off from there. So thank you for listening to me for a couple minutes. And I'm going to turn it back over to Justin. And just a couple other quick things to mention before we wrap up. Uh, we will be hosting a pre-conference workshop uh, before INA calls Blended and Online Learning Symposium, which will take place November 8th, 2015. So if you have an interest in helping us shape how that meeting uh, will go, please reach out to us. I'll be sharing our contact information here shortly. We also wanted to point you to two of our ongoing initiatives, our Virtual Viewpoints podcast. We've got a few episodes posted there, so if you'd like to take a listen, uh, we'll be chatting with folks who are using applicable research in their own practice around blended and online learning, and be on the lookout for more episodes to be posted soon. We also have our guest blogger program, where we invite folks to come and write for our audience about possibly some of the work that they're doing around online, uh, blend, online and blended K-12 research. Also wanted to mention our upcoming webinar, which will be Wednesday, April 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, will be joined again by Dr. Jared Borup, who will be talking about his ACE framework. So if you have an interest in that, please feel free to join us then. And lastly, just sharing out our contact information. If you have feedback for us about the webinar process or about anything else, please feel free to email us at mvlri at mivu.org. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handles are listed there, as well as our LinkedIn address. You can find the recordings of uh, all of our webinars at our YouTube channel. Our YouTube URL is listed there. And you can see a, a list of all of our scheduled upcoming webinars uh, at the subsection of our website there at mvlri.org. So if anyone has any other questions or comments, please feel free to throw them our way in the chat window. Uh, and we hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Take care.